Well, welcome to Focus Today. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson, and it's always a delight to have in the studio with us uh, Mr. Patrick Doyle. He heads up Veritas Counseling, and when he's in the house, everybody just kind of like E.F. Hutton, they just lean <laughs> in, they listen to what he has to say. Most people don't know what you're talking about when you say E.F. Hutton, Barry. Well, you know, there's <laughs> some old folks out there that do. Anyway, um, he's here, he heads up Veritas Counseling. We're talking about a very uh, important topic today, the subject of marriage. Mm and the role of the man. So uh, how you doing, bud? I'm doing great. Are you? You brought a book? I did. I'm going to read out of it. You are? Just one little quote, though. Really? Yeah. I'm this, not going to read the whole thing. This is one of your mentors kind of guy. You know? Yes, it is. This is uh, Dr. Crab? Dr. Crab's new book, Fully Alive. Um, I highly recommend it. It's a uh, biblical vision for gender. And because uh, I think our culture is really uh, muffed up gender yeah. over time. And so um, he comes from a very biblical place to help us understand those roles much clearer so that we can um, live in the freedom that God intended us as men and women rather than being all conflicted about what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to live and that kind of thing. And then those roles really affect your marriage. Mm -hmm. If you're if you if you I, I can't tell you Perry, how many times I've sat with people where a woman says, you know, they feel like the man, mm. you know, because the guy's irresponsible. And you know, that you, you and I and Bud have talked about this, how culture has made adolescence from, you know, 12, it used to be 12 to in the 70s, like, you know, 16, 17. Now adolescence is into the 30s. People are being expected not to be responsible. Oh, they're in their 20s. Used to be that, you know, at a right. certain age, you were expected to grow up and mature. Right. We've extended that very far. And so now you have people that are taking on adult roles, adult res relationships, but are still very immature. And so, you know, part of what we have to do is talk about w what's going to happen if you don't know how to handle emotional reality, if you don't know how to handle, you know, physical responsibility. Mm -hmm. If you don't do those things, those things have relational impact. And so in marriage, one of the things I want to talk about today is, you know, so. We hear all, all this talk about how men, uh, we're supposed to be leaders. Yeah. <laughs> how is a sinner supposed to be a leader? Well. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to respond to that? <laughs> yeah, well, I figured you might know a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Got my hand up. Me I'm too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Me too. So, yeah. you know, it, I, I've heard a lot of it in my life and my, as, my, as I've been to church for many years, that as men, we're supposed to be the spiritual leaders of our family. Mm -hmm. But I've talked to a lot of men that are very confused about what that means. You know, they say on the surface, oh, yeah, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray with my family. I'm going to take them to church. I'm mm -hmm. going to maybe read the Bible to them. I'm going to have devotions or something like that. But I think that is a minimization of spiritual leadership. Uh, so when a difficulty arises in the family... How I handle that is more spiritual leadership than what I prognosticate or what I, you know, wh whatever platitudes I throw out there. Because kids don't do what we say, they do what we do. Mm -hmm. They learn. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's not true. I was a good guy and I was a decent person. My kid's off the rails. Well, <clears throat> but the kid is going to take their value structure from what they see their parents do. And this is why the scripture says, if you if you train them up mm -hmm. in the way that, that he wants them to go, God says, when, later it's going to come back around. Okay. Well, sometimes as parents, we might not see it. It doesn't mean it's not, tr it's not true. So how we behave is more of a leadership than what we say. So, and if you take that in context of a marriage, kids get their picture of marriage from what they watch their parents do. Mm -hmm. How their parents handle conflict, how their dad handles their mom, how their mom responds to their dad, how they interact, and what, how kind of, why are they affectionate, are they distant, do they talk about things, do they resolve conflict, do they argue all the time, how does it, so you know as well as I do, we, we, when we're kids, we just uh, by osmosis absorb that stuff, we see it, and so that's what we do. So <clears throat> as a believer, God's in the business of transforming, right? Mm -hmm. He takes that damaged reality, and no one has a perfect childhood. There's no such thing as perfect parents, so let's just get that, let's just relieve ourselves of that right away, mm -hmm. because all of us fail. And so what, we're gonna, what we do with the failure becomes way more important than whether or not we fail. Mm -hmm. But if we fail, and then we're beating ourselves up, and we feel useless, and we feel like we can never repair it, and it's just, no, it's gone too far, and we sort of fall over, mm -hmm. What does that say? 
What are we teaching that child or the people that are watching her? What are we teaching our spouse? What are we saying to them about how do we love them? And so what I want to do is today I just want to focus on what's your behavior saying? Not what's your platitude saying. You know, okay. if you were to go to your spouse and say, based on just my behavior, <clears throat> how am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm really? trying to drum up business here, Perry. <laughs> Oh, I love it. You're booked, what, I am. Eight a, years out. I got a lot of yeah. business. But my point is, is that <clears throat> that's what really tells the story, how someone's treating me. And I talk to so many people, Perry, who live, they rationalize, they minimize, and they justify their spouse's negative behavior toward them. And then they spiritualize it and be like, well, you know, instead of dealing with it. And then what happens is it builds and the resentment builds and the distance builds. And then we have an explosion. All right, let me take the defensive posture for the okay. man for a moment. Okay. Because I think that a lot of guys um, understand that they're to be spiritual leaders, but yes. we're never taught what it is to be a spiritual leader. Amen to that. And the other thing is they go to church and there's a mm. lot of assumption of what a spiritual leader is. Absolutely. They go and they sit in the pew and they think, well, a spiritual leader is that guy up there preaching. Yeah, exactly. The I, professional. I'm not him. Exactly. Most services, with all due respect, pretty much are designed more for the female than yep. the male. That's true. Some guys are uncomfortable yeah, raising their I hands. I agree. And mm -hmm. not that that's a sign of spirituality. No. Um, right. More guys are internal and more reserved. Mm -hmm. More women mm -hmm. are external. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just being the yeah. basics here. Yeah. So all of a sudden, there is this image of what a spiritual leader is supposed to be, and mm -hmm. they think, oh, there's no way I could be that. Exactly. So all right. What well, do we do with that? You set me right up for this quote. Okay. So I want to read this quote to you, and I think this will sum it, summarize and then give answer to what you're saying. If a man would simply stay moral, stay away from pornography, promiscuity and perversion, if he commits to prioritizing family and friends above career success and employment stability, if he lives responsibly and honestly as he works hard, if he learns to communicate more and shut down less, <laughs> If he does good things for the less fortunate with his time, talents, and money in his community and through his church, and perhaps including an occasional mission trip to Africa, <laughs> wouldn't that be enough? Wouldn't that male be a man? Well, I think that's part of it. So, many good men think so. But that thinking misses the mark. It leaves good men shallow and prematurely content with themselves and untroubled by something that should trouble them. Here's the key. Mm. Their inability to mirror God's penetrating and powerful love by moving deeply into another's soul with life-changing impact. Now, I guarantee you something. Any man who mirrors God's penetrating and powerful love by moving deeply into his wife's soul will not have a problem long term because a woman is going to open up to that all day long unless there's pathological damage and there's some you know big deal that needs to be dealt with but as a rule if we mirror God's and this is one of the things he's saying in the book about mm -hmm. the role of a male is to imitate God's initiative that's one of the things about men that God created us to reveal about him was this this, this ability that God has to initiate. He initiates salvation with us. He came to earth. You know, He is always initiating with us. And so, and one of the ways that women reveal who God is, is by responding. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Make deep quick. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I may even open up the phone line, so stick okay. around. I, right. I, I think that this warrants, uh, if you want to join the conversation, um, we'll do one more segment. We'll op open up the phone lines in the second half of the program. Okay. All right. But um, what is, it, is it true that a woman wants this man, this man, this wants this strong man, the warrior protector, and then when she gets him, her mm -hmm. assignment is to change him. Mm. Well, I think that's a very common dynamic, <clears throat> but I think what, what, what women want, from my experience, is they want somebody who sees who they are. They want somebody who cares about them, who doesn't, doesn't miss the fault that they have or the shortcomings that they have. But a, a, as we've talked about historically, the man is to be a covering, 
right? Not an inspector, not a, a fault finder, not a, a critic, not a, you know somebody who's keeping the bar and you got to keep jumping to try to meet it. So with, if, you, if you look at the, the character of God and how he sort of relentlessly initiates with us, when we fail, what does he do? Does he go, that's it, I'm done, I'm out, sick of this? No. He keeps, and you look at David, and you look at Moses, and you look at the Israelites, and you look at Paul, and you see God just continually moving in, always initiating and bringing them into his presence and helping them see who he is and giving them courage to go on and whatever. <clears throat> so as men, if we reflect that to our wives, mm -hmm. they're going to they're gonna naturally respond. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Crabb says in the book is that if you look at the, just the act of sexuality, what you have is a man moving toward and into his wife and, and a wife being open and, rece and receiving. And what Crabb is saying is that God was painting a picture of the roles in a physical sense. So we are emotional sense as well. It, all senses. So we're okay. supposed to be moving toward our wives and into their situation, and then they respond. But a lot of times what we do as men is we pull back, we get overwhelmed, we don't know what to do, we feel inadequate, and then they, because they're nurturers, they start pushing in. Well, you've done enough counseling. It's yep. all you do. Yep. I've done enough to know that comes the yeah, but. Yep. And we'll you get know. to that. You know, After the break? That's never quite <laughs> enough. So men exactly. shut down. They just go, what's the Exactly. Use? Okay. We'll be right back. Patrick Doyle's in the house. We're talking about marriage and the role of the man in the I do hope you're doing going to do the sequel. Of the oh, one. absolutely. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> you can <laughs> save the email. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paulina and I work at the Dove TV. Did you know that when you support the Dove TV, you have a profound impact, not only in our community, but around the world? It's your continued support that takes the inspiration and hope in the programs we produce and makes them available to the thousands of people who are watching these videos online every week. Help bring encouragement and hope to our valley and beyond by making a secure online donation today at our website, thedove.us. Okay, we're back. Patrick Doyle's in the house, Veritas Counting. We're talking about a subject that uh, affects a big portion of us, and that is uh, what it is to be married, and in particular, the role of the man. Now, let me just say in defense of all of this stuff, we will eventually take on the role of the woman, but what is the role of the man? Because um, part of this is, you know, being the spiritual leader. Right. Um, and you probably do more couple counseling than anything else. Yeah. You know, uh, because yeah. this, this isn't understood right. Right. And is it fair, do most women know what a man should be? Or I, they just have an, uh, um, an imagination or an expectation of what a man should be? Well, I think what's happened, unfortunately, is we've been culturalized. We have a cultural expectation, which is not from a biblical place. And when God designed marriage, he wasn't designing a torture chamber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't? No. no. <laughs> he was designing something that reflected himself. Because mm -hmm. look, if you look at God, you can't understand him wholly without seeing the feminine and the masculine. He's both. Mm -hmm. So he created men and women to reflect who he is, not to uh, be a punisher of the other. And um, so I want you to think about something for a second, and this is my opinion. So in, in the garden, of, of, uh, it, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, who did Eve desire? Well, I think she desired God and she enjoyed Adam. But Adam wasn't her primary focus. God was, as was God's, was God, Adam, his primary focus was God and he enjoyed Eve. They got to enjoy each other, but they weren't focused on each other to get what they needed. They were focused on God. Then the fall happens, God kicks them out and God curses them both, okay? The curse he gives to the woman, he says, I'm gonna increase your pain in childbirth and I'm gonna, it, I'm going to make it so that you desire him and he rules over you. That was a curse. <laughs> Can you hear the pins dropping and well, the radio shutting off? <laughs> Patrick's personal e phone number is area code 541. No, go ahead. So, no, I, I hear you, but go so, ahead. Yeah, so, this, this is good. Yeah. So listen, 
Why would it be a curse for Eve to be ruled over by Adam and for her to desire him? Because he's a fallen, sinful version of what he was. And he's never, ever, ever, even in the garden, going to be God. Mm -hmm. He's never going to be perfect. He's never going to be good enough. So what happens is one of the curses that happened to women was they lost that intimacy with God that was direct. And then it went to where she had to be cared for by Adam rather than God. Would you rather be cared for by God or some dude who's a sinner? <laughs> right? So now with the cross in place, let's be clear. Mm -hmm. Women are no longer subjected to that curse as a result of the cross because you can have instant and, and total access to God via the cross. Mm -hmm. You're no longer dependent on that. But I, I talk to a lot of women who feel that curse because the guy they're with doesn't care, or he's insensitive, or he's selfish, or he's you know shut down, or he's hurt, or whatever, and it's not working out too good. And what I would encourage women to do is stop pushing. Mm. Stop picking. If you push and poke and prod and push and push and prod, I can guarantee you what you're gonna get. From a man, you're gonna get shut down, leave me alone, get away from me. Or you'll get, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And then inside, he's just rage. He's resentful and he's looking for a way out. And uh, I've seen a lot of guys you know, step out of their marriages because they were just irritated for being mm -hmm. poked at. Now, so <clears throat> here's the other thing about ladies I would say that I think is true. Um, you know, how, I, I always say this, that you know, men, one of our go-to sins is pornography or lust. Right, men are just built visually. They we, we look at stuff, mm -hmm. and you know I certainly have experienced that in my own life. And so, kind of our one of our go-to things is, is pornography. Now, women don't necessarily have that; they're not visually motivated. But women have their own kind of pornography, <laughs> and I call it I call I call it this: women do what I call scenario building. Mm -hmm. So something happens, and they start building a scenario in their mind about what should have because and how can we get them because and in in 20 nanoseconds they go from the current situation to standing over somebody's grave the scenarios that they build are never pleasant <laughs> are never positive okay whoa whoa, whoa. <clears throat> just hit something there why are they always negative okay so here's the deal so why why do women lean towards that scenario building right. where we lean towards visual stuff well in my opinion is this i think that god designed women to be nurturers it's a beautiful reflection of who he is. It's a beautiful thing about who they are. They nurture people. You know, my wife is a nurturer. You can't tell her not to. She just does. Mm -hmm. She loves my kids. She loves me. She does for us. And, and she's not expecting anything in return. She, it's part of what she loves to do. It's mm -hmm. like inner. Mm -hmm. So that nurturing nature, if you're nurturing someone, you're automatically more concerned about the outcome. Mm -hmm. because you want it to be good. You want it to go well. So you're working diligently to make it a good outcome. Okay. Well, the problem is you don't have any control. <laughs> so here's the deal. The nurturing nature minus faith in a good God, nurturing nature minus faith in a good God, okay. leads me to a little bit of panic mm. because now i got to control what happens. Mm -hmm. And when I start looking into the future, all I see is problems because I'm trying to avoid all the difficulty. So that's why the scenarios are always about what's bad gonna happen. So is a, is a negative approach to these scenario buildings, mm -hmm. is it a, a lack of trust in God? Yes. A lack of faith? And it's, 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 a little bit, it's a little bit along the lines of idolatry because I'm gonna control it. I'm gonna determine the outcome. No, you're not. I don't care how great a person you are, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care how much power you think you have, no one, no one of us is going to control an outcome. Mm -hmm. If we were in control of the outcome, Perry, you and I would be sitting in a really nice studio right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've well, been working on that for 30 years. Cut. We wouldn't yeah, need Yeah, of course not. Yeah. And so what happens is, you know, women want, they want it to be good, so their nurturing nature gets kind of stirred up and then they start, they start going after things. And what I want to caution them to do with men is don't do that. Reflect God and be patient and wait for him to give you to give you marching orders. Patience. Yes. How do you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I have to have spell correct. Um, but because listen, when when I'm trusting God for the outcome of my man, what happens is I'm more present 
in the relationship instead of being tilted forward and expecting everything. And when a guy feels that, they do this. Or sometimes they come over the top and squash. Can a man be restored to spiritual leader when there's been violations in the relationship? Yes, absolutely. And, and I say that's one of the things we need to be pressing towards. Because um, I don't care. See, I don't believe that if you read the Bible with your wife and you, and you pray with her, I don't think that naturally, necessarily, leads to spiritual leadership. Um, spiritual leadership is about loving someone in a tangible way not having devotions with them. And, you know, maybe the devotions help you love better. But what I see a lot of guys do is they, they, they read the book and they go, okay, I'm going to pray with my wife. I'm going to read the scripture with her. And I'm going to have a date night. And yet they never really open up. They just check the box. You know, we're good at this. What, what do I have to do? Mm -hmm. And we check the boxes. But it doesn't produce intimacy. And so then the wife's like... And the guy's like, see, nothing's ever good enough. I, I, I pray with you. I read the Bible with you. And, but but what, we're, what we're shooting at is the wrong thing. What The whole point of marriage is for us to be intimate. And that means not just on a physical level. That means emotionally. That means spiritually. That means intellectually. Well, I'm telling you what. Intimacy requires a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. And that's not usually the first on my list. <laughs> the first thing on my list is protect myself. Don't get hurt. I mean, Right? We grow up in this world, it's hurtful. People are mean. People do hard things. And so we get married and we want to be close, but we're both sinners. All right, uh, before we take a break, why is it so hard for men and women to connect emotionally? Yeah. Why is it for men that, that he may go out and bust his pick yeah. to provide mm -hmm. and to put the roof over the head and food on the table mm -hmm. and protect and all those things, mm -hmm. and that isn't seen as good enough mm -hmm. or emotionally connecting. Mm -hmm. why? Right. Why, is, why, is, why did God create man this way and mm -hmm. woman that way mm -hmm. and in the middle you got the conflict? What's okay. going on that here? That conflict is designed to drive us to our knees so that we as men will trust Him and develop an intimacy with Him. Because here's the other thing I strongly believe, Perry. I've, I've heard so many sermons on this and, it, and, it, and I'll be honest with you, it irritates me. Mm -hmm. um, we tell men Ephesians 5, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Mm -hmm. um, do you realize I don't have any motive for that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God, I, I oh, appreciate no. the instructions, God, but oh. I don't even want to do that. Uh, I, okay. You know, most men are not designed to be selfless like that. Yeah. So here's the deal. I'm supposed to love my wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself up? I don't have a lot of natural ability for that. I'm mostly selfish. So here's the remedy for that is that, look, if I don't get loved by God in a tangible, real way where I know that God loves me and it transforms what's in me and it develops trust in me, then I got nothing for her because mm. I don't naturally have it. That's the other myth that we can just be good men and be strong and blah, 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 and, you know, it'll work out. Mm, not really. I've got a lot of experience in my office that says that's not true. I've seen a lot of good Christians get divorced. Okay, so listen, if you're going to love your wife, the first thing that's going to happen as a man is you have to be loved by God in a way that's real, not in a way that's platitudinal, not in a way that's about service, that where you know that you're loved, and from that, then you move into your wife. Okay, we're talking about uh, marriage <coughs> and the role of the man and what it is to be a spiritual leader. Maybe you have some questions, comments, or thoughts on this. You're welcome to call. And if you want to remain anonymous, we'll respect that as well. The phone number is 541-776-5368. If you're outside the immediate area, it's toll free, 1-800-373-5368. We'd love to take your calls. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dan and I work at the Dove TV. You know, compared to Portland, Seattle, and LA, Medford might be considered a small market but at The Dove, we're excited about the opportunity to make a big impact right here in our community. And you help make that happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us now by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or by phoning 541-776-5368.
Okay, we're back, and uh, Patrick Doyle's in the house, and we're talking about marriage, and in particular, the man's role in marriage. Now, I just want to say that we will cover the woman's role, so hang in there, all one and all. <laughs> but today, we're talking about the man's role, and in particular, um, what it is to be a spiritual leader, and, and you know, what does that really mean, and, and some of the things like that, because I think there's just been these uh, myths out there. If I yep. can, maybe they're yeah. myths, maybe they're not. Yeah. I don't know, but they, there seems to be this image of what this spiritual man's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I know guys that are just trying their hardest. They're doing a good job, yep. and they'll go to uh, the wife will go to a seminar and come back, and then all of a sudden he's he's not good enough now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to be real careful what you put your ears to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. To. So anyway, uh, if you want to join the conversation, you're welcome to do it. The local number is 541-776-5368, and the toll-free number is 1-800-373-5368. So let's take a couple calls here, uh, Patrick, and see okay. what's going on. Hi, Dave. Uh, what's on your mind? Hey. Um, kind of a, a struggle right now with me. Um, I was unemployed last month. And um, my wife doesn't think I'm out working to find a job enough. Mm. Um, I've got a part-time job right now that the Lord gave me. I know he gave me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm doing what he wants me to. The problem is, is I have a next-door neighbor um, who has a couple homes here in Southern Oregon, one being on the coast, one being here in Medford, and uh, another one uh, up north in the Eugene area. And I have some skills that um, she can use to refurbish one of the decks that her house bought on on the coast. And this lady is willing to pay me. I know the lady. She's a Christian lady. She's trusting. My wife says, absolutely not. Are you to go out there with her? Because it's more than a couple days regardless. And the thing is that I try to tell her is, look, the Lord has given us some income um, outside of a full-time job, and we need to, I need to take this. And she is absolutely forbidding it. And that's a great. <laughs> we both we both have prayed about it. I haven't had a solid answer from the Lord yet. And thirty minutes after she tells me she prays about it, she has an answer, and the Lord tells her to tell me absolutely don't go under any circumstances. And my issue is I'm not being trusted. And even though my wife had a stroke a couple months ago, and we're a very young couple. Um, I don't feel that I'm being trusted by her, and I don't know. So, Dave? Yes, sir. Is there any reason, historically, that she would have not to trust you? Absolutely not. Okay. So, do you, do you believe that she has the ability to hear from God? You know, she's a new Christian. D so, and so, so I can't answer so, that okay. definitely yes or no. So, but what you do know, what you do know is that she's absolutely afraid of you going with this woman to the coast. Yeah, and this lady's in her 70s. So are you going to honor that request or are, are you not becomes the question. Well, I'm going to honor it. Um, okay, so now, it, so now that you honor it, now, but now you're angry. Now you're disappointed. Now well, you're stuck. No, it's not that I'm frustrated. Okay. Because she is still hounding on me to bring in the money, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to do all of this. Right. And I had an opportunity that I missed, and it would have been, you know, five hundred dollars for the three days so, worth of work. So listen, um, you know, when you say uh, frustrated, that's just a, a, a euphemism for angry. And it's my opinion that that anger is the emotion that gets to the surface, but below anger is hurt, and below hurt is injustice. It seems like an injustice being done to you because you don't have, you don't see any reason why she's not, why she shouldn't trust you. This woman's older. She's a Christian. You think it's a safe thing. We need the money. I should go work. So what you need to do is sit down with your wife and say, honey, I feel very hurt that you don't trust me to go get this money with this woman. And tell me why you don't trust me. And let her explain herself and get it out in the open. Rather than just okay. and rather than just sitting there and sort of being angry, 
Good stuff. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate you calling Thanks. in, man. Boy, that's that's powerful stuff. Hi, Lynn. What's your question today? Hi. Um, what kind of help would you suggest for a godly Christian man who uh, is in a cyclic abuse abuse situation where he goes along for a while and does you know all the godly things, and then he gets into this cycle of verbal abuse um, and just almost does it without knowing what he's doing, can't hardly remember what he did. How is a woman supposed to respond to that, or what kind of help can he get? Okay, so is he verbally abusing you or someone else? Uh, me. Okay, and that's a historic thing? Yes. How long? We've been married seven and a half years. Okay, so, uh, and he's, he doesn't seem to have any awareness that he's doing this? I, he, at the, afterwards, he doesn't seem to realize what he's done. He doesn't remember what he's done. Can you, what he said. Is, is there a pattern to his angry response? Is it, can you predict it? Um, certain subject matter, certain... Uh, yeah, yes. Okay, so what, what's happening is he's inappropriately dealing with his anger, obviously if he's abusing you verbally, but here's the deal. No one is angry without reason. It doesn't mean we have to agree with their reason, but it's really important for us to find out what it is. Now, he, you guys may not have the trust um, necessary to bear that discussion. You know what I mean? Yes. He may need to talk to somebody else about what, what he's feeling. But here's the deal. If he's angry, in his mind, there's a legitimate reason. Now, okay. it, doesn't, it doesn't justify his verbal abuse, and I'm not saying that at all. But if we're going to help him get past it, and I, I got the sense from you that there seems to be some, some effort on his part not to do that. Yeah. So he has to get get to a place where he can see what is triggering him. And th when you say he doesn't really remember, that to me indicates that he's triggered. You say something, there's a subject matter, he's got resentment, he's got hurt, he's got loss, he's got something you may or may not know what it is, he may or may not be conscious of it. But if he doesn't get in touch with that, he's not going to okay. stop doing that. He's not going to stop being verbally abusive because here's the deal. It's my opinion that he's being triggered and he can't control it, even if he wants to. Okay. Have you seen yeah. that? Have you seen that look in his eye, like he doesn't really seem to be there? Exactly. Yeah. It's just a blank look, yeah. and he doesn't even look at me when he's talking. It's yeah. like he's looking at a wall. Yeah. So and he just keeps going. He, he's filibustering. He just do, he can go for hours. Does and, Does he have a historic? Uh, does he have a background, a childhood of any kind of abuse? Um, you know, I wondered that myself, but I've asked him, and he said no. <laughs> yeah. But okay, he does well, have he has real issues with abandonment. Okay. Uh, me leaving, doing anything, mm -hmm. uh, leaving the home, going any place. So, Lynn, you're you're dealing with somebody who's traumatized, in my opinion. Okay. Whether they want to admit that or not, whether they see that or not, really doesn't to me matter. He's going to have to talk to somebody else to help him get that stuff to the surface so that he can see it. But he's being he's miserable too. Yes. He doesn't yeah. want to live in that world, I'm pretty sure, because I know I didn't. And, uh, but it's important that you lovingly encourage um, and that you set a boundary and say, look, I'm not going to take any more of your abuse. If you abuse me, I'm going to leave. Yes. Which then triggers him, right? Yes, and so, that's where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm living temporarily someplace else, mm -hmm. and um, I'm lovingly trying to suggest you know, what we can do, uh, because this is the time I have set that boundary. After a few cycles, I've said no more. Good. That's good for you. And I'm telling you, I just want to say this, and anybody out there listening, listen, the most loving thing you can do to somebody who's out of control is give them a consequence. Because no one changes without difficulty. And so if you keep taking it, you're enabling them to continue to stay in the painful reality they're in. So you setting this boundary is actually the most loving thing you could do. But it does put at risk the relationship, which yeah. is how it is. So we'll pray, we'll ask God to bring conviction to him and to bring insight. And it's my opinion, Lynn, that he's going to need some help professionally. Okay. okay. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you so much. Okay, you bet. Okay. All right, uh, seven seven six five three six eight is the number, or the local number five four one seven seven six five three six eight, or toll free one eight hundred 
373-5368. Before we take a break, something out of these two calls triggered me. Okay. Um, um, what if some of the anger response, whether it's from the, the husband or the wife, right, is a result of them just not getting their own way? In other words, yeah. uh, they're angry that mm -hmm. you are not accepting or you become a roadblock to what yeah. they want to do. And it, it can go both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not an injustice. It's just nothing more than a control issue. Right, exactly. That's, that's another side of it. And so that whole self-centered approach is a whole nother ball of wax. I mean, when we're talking about with Lynn's situation, um, and, it, and it, I think Dave's also, those, I think those people were being triggered by something, mm -hmm. okay? And so their behavior was a response to that trigger. Then there's other circumstances where somebody's just, just, just outright selfish, and they'll use anger as a way to control you into doing what they want. Okay. Let me take a break. We'll be right back. We have a couple calls waiting. If you'd like to join us, you're welcome to do it. Patrick Doyle's in the house, and uh, um, he's the man right there, <laughs> Veritas Counseling. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Paula and I work at the Dove TV. Every day we get letters and emails from people who've been encouraged, blessed, and challenged by the programs on the Dove TV. But we couldn't do it without you. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to bring inspiration and hope to our community by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or call us at 541-776-5368. Okay, uh, Patrick Doyle's with us today, Veritas Counseling, and uh, a subject that I know that touches a lot of us uh, very deeply, and uh, deals with marriage and the role of the man in marriage, and uh, what it is to be a spiritual leader. Now that triggers all kinds of <laughs> yeah. conversations and yes. things. And uh, so let's get back to the phones quickly so we don't run too much out of time here. Okay. Debbie, thanks for waiting. What's, uh, what's your question? Hi, we have a friend that we've known for probably 20 years, and he's married now for several years with three kids, mm. but he seems to be totally incapable of giving his wife emotional support. Mm. He's been to counseling many times, including with my husband as a pastor, mm -hmm. and he'll check the boxes, but mm -hmm. he just can't give her any emotional support, and he tears her down Verbally, too. When you say doesn't give her any emotional support, w w does he lack empathy in general? He has no role model from his dad as far as that, but he, like, he thinks telling her thanks for a good dinner is all the encouragement she needs for the day. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't do emotional intimacy with anyone? Mm, no. Right. So that's He's not he doesn't seem able to. Right. And that may be true. There's a lot of people that, I mean, that was my situation until God broke through and started to deal with me and my own stuff because I was raised in a, and I, was ra I always tell people I was raised by wolves. You, you couldn't be emotionally available. It would, it would be dangerous and damaging. So if, if he's got some of that in his background, he needs somebody to help him really unearth that stuff so that he can, you ever heard of something called frozen conclusions? No. So many of us, when we, when, we're grow, when we grow up, we're taught stuff. I was taught stuff in my family that no one ever said, but it was very clear that you do not take a risk. Okay? I'm oh, a that kid. Would be him. I, I, I get that message as a kid, and it goes in my head, and then it becomes what we call a frozen conclusion. That conclusion is frozen, and it won't change. You can't mess with it. So, and it took God to come in and say, no, 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 no. Yes, in your family it was dangerous to take a risk, but you're not there anymore. I'm here and I'm going to help you. And there's other people who aren't like that. So he had to unfreeze those conclusions in my mind. This guy's going to need somebody to help him. But what you're describing is actually very um, popular. And unfortunately, I think it's popular in the church because what I see guys do is they spiritualize that behavior and make it seem noble to uh, be distant and spiritual and intellectual and all that, rather than being intimate, which is what God calls us to be. Well, as a friend, how could we help him break through that? You tell him he needs to get help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you don't have the skill. Right. Or the time, probably. Yeah. 
but okay. th but as loving friends, you just say, look, man, you're you're stuck, and you need to get some help from somebody who can. If you go to a counselor and that doesn't, you don't get unstuck, then go to another one. You got to mm -hmm. find somebody who can help you because you know all counselors are not equal, so you got to find out what works. All right. Well, Thanks, thank you, Patrick. You Thanks, bet, Debbie. All right, let's go to. Hello, ma'am. You're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, Hi. Patrick. Thanks. Uh, I just really appreciate your your perspective and speaking up about these things. Sure. I, I have a question regarding. You were talking about how God's idea of marriage uh -huh. is where the man is coming toward and into the woman, and yes. she is opening up in response. Yeah. Well, how does a marriage relationship involving abuse look different from? Right. What you described when that picture does not happen, like you know, the woman's pushing or the men's backing up, and mm -hmm. how does how does it look different in an abusive relationship? Um, so be more be more specific with me about abuse. Are you talking about a man abusing a woman, or a woman abusing a man, or just both people? Or yeah, I'm thinking in my own um, situation of my husband abusing me. Okay, you know, and I don't I don't see myself necessarily pushing, I see myself backing away, but at the same time, now that I'm recognizing it, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of pushing the, the issue to, well, to, okay, you Okay, know. so I think I got a clearer picture. So, in your relationship, has it been safe for you to confront him about anything? Um, not really. Not really. It comes back at me. Okay, so, so there's no safety to have an opinion or to disagree. Right. So, I've done a show on that historically. I think it's on the Dove somewhere. I did a show about emotional abuse. And when someone's unwilling to take responsibility for anything, and they're always right, and many times these people are um, highly spiritual. They're spiritual. They have a lot of spiritual language, or they're very intellectual. They have a way of shutting you down and, and re-explaining it. But the key component is they never take responsibility for anything. Right. They blame shift. I always say it like this. Those people have what I call um, Teflon, responsibility Teflon. <laughs> Nothing sticks to them. Just slides right off. And the person right. they're with ends up with responsibility Velcro. So everything mm -hmm. sticks to you. That's never true in any relationship under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. We all are sinners and God calls us to repentance. And I I'll say this and I I'll take the flag for it because I believe it. But when God says, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit for two reasons, those reasons are to convict you of sin and to comfort you, right? Mm -hmm. If I don't see conviction and or comfort in someone, I don't believe they have the Spirit. I don't care what they say. So right. have you ever seen your husband be convicted by God? Not sorry that he lost something, not mad that he didn't get his way, but that, that idea of being broken by God, convicted that you're wrong. God himself has revealed that to you, and that breeds humility, which I believe most women find attractive. Right. So if he's unwilling or incapable to do that, what can you do about it? Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's the question. <laughs> you, the question is you can't do anything. Except right. pray that God brings conviction and set a boundary and keep it and let the pain of that boundary be part of God's work. But again, like I said before, you have to be willing to put the relationship at risk. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. You bet. You know, boy, this sparks so much. <laughs> uh -huh. We'll probably go for a couple hours here. But, uh -huh. um, what? <sighs> there, there is this assumption that the man is more wrong than the woman. Is yeah. that a safe thing to say? Um, I think I think um, I think in the Christian world has been painted that way. And the reason why I think is because we've been given the the mantle of of leadership. Yeah. So that leaves us with the lion's share of responsibility. Right. Right. And so that and may that may be true at well, times. So, so if you don't. If you don't meet that role, then you're weak everywhere else. Yeah. Okay. And, but and, there is and this perception, for the most part, the man is in air, the woman is trying, right. is the spiritual one trying to get it to all work. Uh huh. Um, but uh, there are times where a man really is trying and the woman has got all the issues. Yeah. And she hides behind the fact that he isn't spiritual enough. Right. Right. When, when, when really, she's got some real concerns here. I mm -hmm. mean, there is no intimacy because, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. Yeah. But, um, 
Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you say? What do you do? Well, you know, I, I've said I say it, I've said it many times is that you know, in the idea of us being leaders and women naturally responding to our, you know, uh, good willed initiation. If it's good willed, I believe most women will respond, except for cases where women have been traumatized mm -hmm. and they haven't dealt with it, and then. And then the very goodwill that you have is a trigger for them to pull away. Okay. Because the culture has, for the most part, feminized or weakened masculinity. Oh, my gosh. And so... That's why I recommend this book. Yeah. And so, therefore, when a man is strong, it is seen as almost aberrant or is yeah. seen as something that shouldn't be, well, you know... And we've been feminized. And... Yeah. And and I don't mean that. In a, I don't mean to say that. Yeah, feminism, but the culture has feminized us. Well, that's what I mean. The yeah. culture we live in, and the church has taken suit. Yeah. Um, you, you know, church, like you mentioned before, I think is really geared toward a feminine reality. Yeah. You don't see a lot of visceral. You know, I mean, it, it's <laughs> we've and, and you know we have responsibility because I think a lot of times as men we've abdicated that yeah. instead of you know saying wait a minute no. Um, we're going to do it this way. Well, it's, um, just, it's just easier. It's just more peaceful. I mean, yeah. Why, why have an argument? Well, and, and, and I say, see, that's, that's, that's the way God is. God's like, well, we're going to have an argument because we're going to get to the truth, son. You, you, I'm not giving you a free pass. God's relentless <laughs> in His love of us in that way. He doesn't let it go. He keeps coming back, which is why we're still walking with Him, which is why we're still maturing, because He keeps moving us forward. And we resist. And sometimes I agree, and sometimes I resist, and sometimes, and I don't think that's ever going to change. I'm hoping the percentages change. I'm hoping my agreement goes up and my resistance goes down. <laughs> but you know, depends on the day you ask me. So the um, the reality though is is that um, everyone has some level of pathological damage, mm -hmm. and, and, and let me let me explain that because a lot of people that are listening might not understand what I mean when I say pathological. So. When you go to the doctor, if, the, if I go to the doctor and he says, look, you have diabetes, and I'm like, oh, man. He's like, so we got to intervene on your diabetes. What we know about diabetes, if, if you don't intervene, diabetes will go from here, and it will follow a path that's the same every time and go to here. Mm -hmm. So the disease of diabetes has a pathology. It's predictable. Mm -hmm. People have emotional and spiritual pathology. Mm -hmm. That's why sometimes people come to my office and they start telling me about the person they're dealing with and then I start predicting and telling them what they're already doing and they haven't told me anything and they're like, how do you know that? I'm like, it's pathology. Yeah. They, they do it the same every time and they're like, yeah, they do. So it becomes predictable. If somebody has that pathology, you got to recognize it as such and disentangle yourself from it a little bit, which is like, that's their issue. I can pray, I can engage it, but I can't take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. It's not my deal. My job is to put my shoulder under the plow and help move them forward. But I can't be taking responsibility for their sickness. And we do this a lot in the church because we're going to be good Christians. Well, that's not what God called us to. God didn't call me to be responsible for your sin. God called me to love you and to tell you the truth in love. Mm -hmm. Okay, And I think that holds for marriage. We don't... I, so many people, Perry, that come to my office are not honest with each other. Yeah. yeah. All right, we've got about a minute. Uh, is it okay for a man to take a Sunday off and go hunting or fishing? I hope he does. Okay. He needs to. Thanks, guys. I had to get that in. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah. yeah I mean, you can't be, you have to have a life. Yeah. And I think that's true for both parties. Yeah. But it, it's not to the exclusion of the other. Right. If somebody's hunting or doing sewing or whatever to the exclusion of the relationship, then it becomes a problem. But I've never met a woman who has a man who loves her and doesn't let him go hunting. All right, quickly, the book. The book, uh, Fully Alive by Dr. Crabb. I'd highly recommend it. Um, get it, read it, live right. it. Check it out at Evangel <laughs> or Christian Discount Book. Yeah. Uh, he's going to a seminar where he comes back and will even be smarter. We'll That's talk right. to him on the other side. <laughs> See you next time on Focus <laughs> Today. <laughs>
at our website, thedove.us.